Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Tran Lee. I'm the Vice President of Product Management for Guardian Analytics. Our presentation today will address how organizations can protect themselves from account takeover and other fraud scams following the Equifax breach. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Andras Chair. Andras is the Vice President and Principal Analyst in Security and Risk for Forrester Research. His expertise and focus centers around identity management, cloud security, and fraud management. Thank you, Andras, for joining us today. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Eric. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, you can. Okay. Very good. Uh, so welcome, everyone. This is Andres Chair from Forrester Research. I'm a Vice President and Principal Analyst uh, at Forrester, and I cover um, fraud management as well as uh, identity and access management. So today's webinar is really uh, an interesting topic. Uh, really, I want to talk a bit about uh, how to minimize uh, fraud losses, how to future-proof your compliance strategy for the future. So first of all, it is a very important aspect of uh, fraud management that we are seeing actually three different uh, forces at play here, right? One is security, and beyond security, minimizing your fraud losses, right? And so how are you able to at least maintain your fraud losses or uh, decrease your fraud losses and, and keep your security uh, really solid, keep the bad guys out? So that is always the problem, and it, it's the operationalization of any new technology that has to take this into account. The second thing is, which is in the bottom of this slide, is operational efficiency. So even as we are trying to keep our uh, uh, bad guys out, right? Uh, we cannot drown ourselves in investigation activities, right? So basically what it means, we cannot spend an unlimited amount of time on investigating false positives. We have to actually automate uh, the uh, investigation, automate defenses. And basically, if you ask me maybe five, six years ago, you know, what other aspects were there, I would have said this is it. But in the past, uh, two to three years, we are seeing in, as, uh, as an important, an increasingly important factor, the customer satisfaction and reducing customer friction becoming um, an important um, requirement in fraud management. So this is basically all about the fact that customers actually have a choice. They can go to some other um, service provider and really uh, are able to kind of move away from us, right? Move away from your organization if you are presenting too much, uh, too many challenges for them to get enrolled, do transactions, etc. cetera. Uh, obviously, uh, as uh, we look at the, the market and, and the best practices for fraud prevention. You know, fraud, uh, fraudsters don't really have to be compliant, right? So fraudsters can basically do whatever they want. They can move between sites. Uh, they can attack one resource after another. Banks actually do have to be compliant, right? So you, we have uh, AML, KYC, BSA, and other types of uh, compliance requirements that you cannot just do whatever you want if you're if you're a bank trying to fight fraudsters. Um, fraudsters only have to get it right once, right? So if they strike and if they are able to get money, you know, it's highly unlikely they'll uh, call again, right? Uh, so they have to kind of be able to hit and run. That's all it is. Banks, on the other hand, and any kind of organization that needs to protect against fraudulent activity has to get it right all the time. So you kind of have to have uh, uh, really solid, robust, and repeatable controls. Uh, a lot of the omni-channel models are behind in fraud management. What this means that is that you have uh, new uh, channels of transactions such as uh, AIs or robots or uh, automated agents, but also mobile apps, mobile channels, uh, in-person channels, kiosks, email or snail mail channels, right? You have to basically be looking at all those channels and, and be able to uh, take into account all the activity that happens on those. Otherwise, you are going to miss uh, fraudulent activity. Enterprise fraud management or e 
ESM data and analytics are really, really hard to get these days. Um, I just had a friend tell me an anecdote at that really at Stanford, uh, basically 25% of the total user population uh, wants to study um, some kind of AI and machine learning algorithms. So it's really, really a hot topic. It is really increasingly hard to get uh, the right skills to build out your program. Here, so you have to be able to rely on on uh, vendors as well as uh, uh, consortium models to, to get this right. You cannot do this all your on your own. Uh, the cost of online fraud and mobile fraud is also increasing pretty fast, right? So if you look at the, these bars, uh, the, the dark blue bar is 2015 data, the, the light blue bar is 2016 data. It's clear to see that. Um, Basically, the total cost per dollar of fraud losses has been increasing on both on the online channel and mobile channel, right? So this is a bigger problem as mobile devices become more and more dominant, prevalent. Uh, you have to be able to uh, in, uh, follow the uh, the transactional growth on these devices as well as uh, follow the growth of fraud on these devices and be able to uh, offend, uh, basically fight against this. Um, really, the percentage of successful fraud transactions among large remote or e-commerce merchants, again, online channel-wise, uh, it's it's been decreasing, but on the mobile channel, it's absolutely staggeringly increasing. So these are data points from LexisNexis's uh, cost of fraud studies. So absolutely staggering uh, numbers here. Uh, obviously, fraud will impact and have an impact on, on a lot of different transaction types, right? So fraud will impact your cards, payment transactions, card present and card not present, right? We saw that DMV took care of uh, most of the card fraud. It did, in fact, in, in, for card present transactions for the most part, but for card not present transactions, there's definitely an increase here. Um, ACH payments, wire payments, ATM-based transactions, um, still are, are, are hard uh, to protect. A lot of times ATM machines have down rev uh, controllers or operating, embedded operating systems in them which have not been patched for a long time. And online banking uh, definitely and, and real time and peer to peer transactions are all subject to fraudulent activities. So definitely it's, it's a huge uh, and difficult uh, set of areas to, to protect. And, and like I said, the uh, impact of fraud is, is really most uh, 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 palpable on a lot of different uh, channels, right? So you, you have to kind of look across at the online and mobile channels um, and, and mobile, with mobile web and native mobile applications running on, on uh, tablets, smartphones, et cetera. Point of sale kind of fraud. So when you're accepting payments, uh, basically, you know, using card card payments, in person types of transactions, call centers, kiosks, chats and chatbots, emails and spam emails, may have been types of transactions. So I think it's uh, it is fairly uh, uh, easy to say, right, that this is a pretty hard problem to solve. This is some something that is actually a lot of uh, the contains has a lot of difficulties. And if you look at uh, a comparison, right, of um, uh, of transactions, the mobile channel also has has really a lot of uh, gotchas, right? The mobile fraud is, is basically hard to detect because usually business has a higher tolerance for mobile fraud. They a lot of times push a mobile first strategy. Uh, the IP addresses of mobile devices change frequently, so you cannot just uh, basically base your detection techniques on the fact that you have a static IP address uh, from, uh, from uh, somebody's home or ISP or work, right? Uh, the fraudster's uh, IP address uh, will change. Old uh, man-in-the-browser kind of detection or MITB detection type of techniques don't work. You cannot really necessarily install plugins into browsers on mobile devices. It's really hard. Uh, a lot of the 3D secure technology that, that we see still in use, you know, especially 3D secure 1.x protocols, have not really been designed for mobile devices, right? There's a lot of redirects in these transactions which mobile browsers may not be able to handle well. Uh, um, and legacy enterprise fraud management tools can't really cope with the real-time device and location data. So even if you're able to capture real-time device and location data, it's really hard 
to actually uh, uh, feed into the decisioning and the model that you're using for your scoring transactions. And a lot of in a lot of the countries, you have mobile network operator based payments schemes where you can pay with text messages or or just uh, basically using your phone. Um, and these are relatively close and really really hard to monitor. But again, um, you may be losing money because of this. So. What are some of the ways? What 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 are some of the recommendations, right, that we give out to our uh, our clients? Well, uh, I think the uh, the recommendations really revolve around these areas. So, getting the data, and I'm going to talk about each one of these areas in a bit more detail. Then, integrating the data, uh, applying machine learning based risk scoring algorithms. Are using risk-based authentication, so basically not inconveniencing all users, you know, uh, at the same level. Using biometrics to improve the customer user experience. Using behavioral passive authentication to look at and monitor the session and apply continuous authentication. And finally, um, uh, tuning the models for risk scoring and really tuning expectations and understanding the operational impacts of of uh, implementing a new fraud management system. So getting the data. Uh, getting the data is absolutely important. Uh, there is a lot of uh, data that we, we can look at, right? A lot of times you have the AML, cyber, and fraud teams already capturing these data somewhere. So a lot of times you don't have to kind of go about and get the data from uh, distinct data sources. You may be capturing data that is relevant for the fraud operations in an AML or cybersecurity, IT security context, right? Um, some of the attributes that we've seen people using are, are two GPS location from mobile devices or even uh, if you're if it's available from uh, from desktops. Looking at the device power settings, what this means is that basically fraudsters typically emulate mobile devices in on a farm or on a desktop, and which means that they're able to kind of uh, do more of um, more create more fraud losses. Device power settings are really uh, important and interesting to look at because for a true mobile device, you will see you know charging patterns. So overnight, you'll charge your phone and it will be, the battery will uh, uh, basically uh, deplete during the day. And you can kind of see those uh, graphs. You see those levels of the battery changing. That is a sign that this is a true mobile device, and you can query that. Touch screen attributes, that means you know how you're touching the screen, what the resolution of the touch screen is. Um, a lot of times you can also look at the force with which the, uh, the user is actually manipulating that device. Biometric data from sensors, so finger, microphone, camera. And finally, jailbreaking and rooting information. So understanding whether this device has been jailbroken or rooted. Um, sometimes banks do want to allow that, uh, customers whose phone are uh, whose phones are jailbroken or rooted, but they may want to apply higher, uh, uh, basically, the levels of scrutiny and, and levels of uh, authentication for those customers. And again, we can get email and SIM data to actually identify the phone. This is also phone numbers. Uh, also can be brought into the, the mix, you know, how long the phone number has been in, in existence, is it a ported number, and so on. So once you got the, the data, we see uh, successful organizations actually integrating the data. So what this means is basically creating link graphs or social network analysis, entity analytics, to understand how transactions are related to each other, right? To understand um, if you have basically maybe a common phone number or an address in, in multiple uh, uh, credit application attempts. Or are you seeing a, a device ID? that is repeatedly appearing in fraudulent uh, applications or, or loan origination uh, requests. And then basically based off of these, you can identify broader customer activity and, and create your segmentation dynamically. This is another area where we see a lot of movement from fixed limits like you know $500 are available for every check that you deposit immediately to uh, move more towards the dynamic segmentation here, right? Depending on a customer's own activity or their peer group's activity, these limits may change. 
And basically, integrating mobile fraud and, and management with other channels is very important. So again, mobile is not on its own. You have to expand this to others. And building user and device behavioral profiles to detect anomalous and, and fraudulent behaviors is absolutely a, a critical. So again, understanding how the user behaves, how the device behaves, where it's, uh, where it's located, what the device ID is doing, and so on, is, is very important. Next, once you've collected the data and integrated the data, uh, you probably want to do some risk for it, right? So we see an overwhelming move here towards using, uh, towards uh, augmenting uh, basically rules-based systems with machine learning uh, algorithms, which really typically supports the shift of decision-making uh, from batch-based or next day to real-time. Uh, reducing the reliance on static rules, right? You know, static rules obviously become very inaccurate over long periods of time. Um, they may, you know, fraudsters may work around them and really understand how the rules work, and they'll basically um, uh, just circumvent the rules and kind of go under the radar. Uh, so if, if you basically flag every transaction that for, for purchase of an e-commerce provider that's over, say, a thousand dollars. Fraudsters will basically split their uh, losses to, or split their fraudulent pay, uh, payments or transactions to $950. Once you set that limit, they'll kind of go lower. So again, this is a, a, a cat and mouse game, key game going on. And also, very importantly, uh, rules in fraud management systems actually require a lot of maintenance, right? So you have to monitor those rules, understand their impact, understand that what a change means in a business, um, and really uh, look at all this and, and manage these rules. And a lot of times, this is an expensive process. You have to hire people to do this. Uh, any kind of change can have financial impacts. So this is very important to do carefully, which means it, it, it requires personnel and costs a ton of money. Um, a lot of times we see uh, machine learning algorithms being used because there is little or no training data being used. If you have a uh, new channel or new transaction type, you may not have training data on, on that transaction type. Uh, machine learning algorithms, especially unsupervised machine learning algorithms, are very useful for auto-defining clusters of transactions and basically detecting anomalies from from the normalcy of uh, and patterns here. So, reducing the fraud enterprise fraud management transparency to fraudsters again no fixed limits uh, because you're if you're using machine learning you're no longer relying only on these very static rules uh, the fraudsters will be less likely uh, to be able to actually figure out your systems and defenses and kind of stay under the radar so again um, no fixed limits and, and no fixed uh, segmentation may be may be important here um, again, the next thing is once uh, you basically are integrated, have integrated the data, uh, collected the data, integrated the data, and do the risk scoring, you also have to look at the impact of behavioral biometrics on the session, right? What this boils down to is that if, to reduce account takeovers, you want to move away from the what you know passwords, the what you have tokens, and uh, who you are, so the legacy device fingerprint, uh, you know, human biometric fingerprint, such as uh, facial recognition or the thumbprint or uh, basically voice recognition, but kind of look at uh, more dynamic behavioral biometrics, uh, which really boils down to how you move the mouse, how you uh, swipe the screen, how you type on the keyboard, how you hold the device. Um, et cetera. So basically continuously throughout the session. So this basically reduces uh, the, the chance that if, if you have a fraudster, they can steal a username and password and log in, but you'll be monitoring the transactions uh, throughout the whole, um, the whole session. And lastly, um, we see a lot of organizations basically paying attention to tuning the models and expectations appropriately, right? Uh, so the user devices and, and patterns and behaviors should be set into machine learning models to actually detect uh, anomalies to understand uh, what the users have been doing. So basically building out a behavioral baseline and then uh, detecting any kind of deviations from that baseline is, is a very important thing. Um, you can obviously look at this 
uh, by determining the user's own behavior or looking at a peer group, be uh, peer group behavior. Uh, risk factors can be derived from device activities and device fingerprinting. So basically, if you see a device uh, suddenly being rooted or suddenly moving from one location to another, or you see a huge change in the device or phone number being swapped out on a device, these are all attributes uh, around a device that can lead to high risk scores. And then basically deriving risk insights from device access patterns. So understanding how a user actually interacts with the device is also a very important uh, aspect here. Is the user activity uh, getting more frequent on the device, basically after the, the, there's no, been no user activity on the device? Uh, are we seeing any uh, kind of a sharing of, of the device between various uh, users, right? This can be obviously mistaken. It's mistaken it's basically known good activity such as family members kind of passing uh, the mobile device to each other can be obviously mistaken for, you know, fraudsters doing the same thing. So again, uh, you, you have to look at all these uh, patterns uh, across multiple devices and on the same device to basically understand the true intent of, of, a, of a user. And finally, uh, basically behavioral auto passive authentication. Again, if you have a new device, new uncharacteristic low profile, bigger distance from an archetype, uh, it is, it's important to kind of take that all that in, into account. So uh, looking at all, all across channels on the online web, mobile app, call center branch, et cetera, and including the online web and, uh, as well. And really uh, looking at sensor data, touch swipe, mouse movements, patterns, as I said, typing, such as speed, is something we've seen uh, all over the map here. Uh, people trying to kind of capture and build profiles out of these, uh, uh, these attributes. And again, if there is an anomaly, uh, you can either um, slow down the user or revoke certain privileges from the user and basically disable certain types of activities. So you may be able to look at only your accumulation, but you may not be able to actually um, uh, add a new payment or add a new pay. Or um, if uh, there is an anomaly, uh, you might be able to log out the user totally completely. So again, that's another important aspect here as well. Some predictions. Um, we will, I think we're seeing social engineering playing a greater role in fraud management and money laundering, and we have to train your employees to detect fraud. Uh, we see on surprise machine learning gaining ground in risk scoring. Again, fewer uh, data points are available for actually training. New models are kind of popping up all the time. Vertical specific modeling, so kind of creating risk models for you know, various verticals like banking, healthcare, e-commerce, uh, manufacturing services, etc. Cryptocurrency support, so more and more uh, um, support for uh, making cryptocurrency payments, Bitcoin, etc. Blockchain being used uh, in anti-money laundering and fraud management activities, so being able to ascertain a good profile based on other financial services, uh, known good or known bad activities, and basically correlating user activity against those, or risk scoring user activity against those is, is absolutely important. Uh, Real-time model adaptation and selection, so uh, models are changing, and, and if you see um, behavior changes, then you have to adapt your models to those behavioral changes. A lot of times this is, is a, today is a very um, a manual and slow process. So in the future, we'll see a lot more uh, mul systems with multiple models where you're able to use ensembles and even tune the models based on behaviors in real, real time. Um, monitoring the suspicious uh, behavior at all at account creation, login, and updates of profiles. So again, looking at the transactional tree of, of, of uh, approach, registration, authentication, step of authentication, transaction, etc., and really providing a non-intrusive way to detect fraudulent activity without actually having to buy new sensors. So again, really important that we need to curb our investment, right? We cannot necessarily invest in new kinds of sensors. We have to make do and, and use the sensors that we have, and maybe accelerometers or, uh, or fingerprint sensors, facial uh, sensors, uh, or, or microphones, right, on these devices. So in a nutshell, um, what, what we're seeing here is that 
the whole underlying current of fraud management that we've seen is basically a, a move away from black box systems where you might have some signatures and really some rules in a system which may or may not be exposed to you more towards uh, behavioral profiles where you have machine learning algorithms and looking at behaviors dynamically learning from uh, the changes to behaviors at all and also investigator feedback if you have seen false positives you know once you mark certain transactions as false positive your model should not be picking up those in the future so again finding the the upside down yellow umbrella in a, in a, in a big crowd of black umbrellas is, is definitely um, based off of, of mobile uh, off of uh, behavioral profiles and machine learning algorithms so with that, um, I'd like to conclude uh, my part of today's webinar and hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Andres. Um, so Andres has um, talked about the, the necessity to move from rules to profiles, behavioral analytics. Uh, what I will uh, share with you today is, is two things. Uh, from, a, from a practitioner standpoint in fraud management based on AI and machine learning, we will share with you why in the post Equifax breach world, it is even more important uh, to, uh, to be in behavioral analytics driven. And more importantly, what is the impact uh, on the current money in, money out flow uh, regarding uh, you know, fraud management? So, Post-Equifax and pre-Equifax pre and post-Equifax. I mean, what is really uh, the, the difference? I mean, sadly, in 2016, um, most of the black market would get a social security for about 30 bucks. Uh, you could have a full bank account number for about $300 and, and a full identity for about 500. Uh, now, post-Equifax, Besides the, the, the creativity, which is cheaper, right? One dollar and you multiply five X if you want to have associated data. But the, pros, the most important change is now the fraudster have access to an entire correlated set of data points for each victim. It's almost like they would have a user 360 that most marketing team would love to have, but cannot for privacy reason, they do. And, and so they can get very quickly uh, to to the your identity and or either you are a, 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 a consumer or a merchant So what does it mean? Uh, there are a couple of point of compromise that will be more at risk than others and obviously since uh, the froster has no access to your identity uh, So they know your email name. Uh, they know your username. Uh, you may change your password or not uh, So it's becoming very easy uh, all the techniques that uh, Andres were, Foster techniques that Andres were referring to from uh, uh, social engineering to phishing, smishing, and or um, basically session uh, hijacking is very sophisticated. Uh, these days, they don't need to be that sophisticated. I mean, they can go in, since they have your password, your username, they go try the first password. You didn't change it, they are in. Uh, at that point, they're switching to account takeover. Uh, and the first point of compromise is obviously anything that it has to do with online, be they uh, online portal uh, for retail banking, online um, supplier vendor portal, um, anything that is online access is at risk because uh, the merchant ID or the user ID is actually open and there's no way that your first line of defense can catch that because it's totally legitimate. The second point of compromise is anything that has to do with money in and money out uh, because they are able to get in uh, at that point, uh, they pass the first line of defense. So unless you try to track anomalous behavior, um, they can do you know, malicious activities on the back. So how Guardian Analytics, uh, it will first of all detect, and then we're gonna talk about how to prevent. So in terms of detection, uh, the first line of defense on online, we will have products that basically detects fraud uh, from a behavioral analytics standpoint using AI and machine learning so that it is uh, less friction uh, uh, at, at, at the user um, input, where we're gonna detect online suspicious activities, for example, a logging time, account creation updates, or, or you know, change of password. 
we will detect suspicious device patterns. Uh, for example, if you know those mobile devices are being connecting from um, a geo location that is suspicious. And more importantly, because we are doing so, um, we will avoid chargeback by averting fraudulent transactions. What it does mean, and before going into the payment fraud is, most of the system online, if you happen to be a, a, a payment gateway or a payment facilitator or a third party, um, you know, money service provider here, the, the regulatory compliance rules uh, makes you in some cases liable because you're in the middle of uh, the consumer transaction and the supplier transaction, uh, you, are, you, have, you are liable to charge back. Uh, the, the one situation with charge back, as we all know, is it does occur three or six weeks down the road. Uh, so it's very difficult at that point to go back and detect you know, who was fraudulent, unless, unless you have the ability on the payment fraud side to investigate uh, and analyze all the online banking activities from logging to logout, logout from that very merchant ID or that consumer, that account holder, that is being flagged suspicious. Yeah, again, a uh, risk scoring mechanism that is machine learning driven. Um, and we're gonna talk about what we mean by this in terms of machine learning. But mostly, Guardian Analytics will provide at the front uh, protection uh, with uh, behavioral analytics, both on the user devices and the, the behavioral patterns of the user, and on the back by basically anal analyzing the transaction and uh, via risk-based scoring, prioritize the type of alert priority you will have. Uh, and as such, we're reducing fraud losses and risk. Now let's talk a little bit about what it does mean if you have to implement those. Um, basically, there's, there's a two step. One of which is as the machine learning is detecting those fraud and score it, the question is how you're gonna protect and prevent. And that part is the two ways, uh, two -way stream. We're gonna send you, uh, um, you know, basically an event score uh, that on, on top of which via our API, you can act on it. So the, the simplest use case would be if we identify a device that is, uh, have a, 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 a suspicious geolocation, we would score it high and send it over to your multi-factor authentication whereby you can either challenge uh, or reject uh, the login so that at least at that point you, you will be protected. But in the post Equifax world, they're probably gonna go through because the, the challenge response, they may know it. Um, so at that point on the back, we have uh, a policy workflow API base also for you to either stop the transaction at the supplier side on the invoice or um, with the banking, um, the banking ecosystem we have on the back, you can able to stop the transaction at the bank. So it's a, it's a dual process whereby we can protect at the front and protect at the back with the ability for you to interact with the system and use your own uh, protection to go and prevent uh, the, 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 the fraud. So we talk a lot about behavior analytics, AI and machine learning. By the way, AI is just a, a subdomain of machine learning. It's been there for 20 years. It's just resurrecting from a marketing standpoint. But you know, I'm gonna talk about machine learning mostly. Uh, this is a very simplistic example to show why it is so important to adopt that. Uh, knowing that the, the froster has already passed your first line of defense, the only way for you is to understand what is normal versus abnormal. And at the end of the day, it's about historical time series and looking over the past to understand what used to be your normal behavior and why suddenly that behavior starts to deviate. And you can see here, you know, this is a so happened that we, we the use case is a wire, but you can it could be anything. It could be online banking. It could be you know e-commerce. Um, usually the froster doesn't know your normal behavior, or let's say they don't know the way you type. They don't know the way you navigate. So the machine learning would catch that by just learning and baselining the normalcy of your behavior. In this case, you log in knowing that you know hopefully you don't have a situation where you forgot your password. Then you enter your mount to be wire, you enter the wire routing number and you submit your wire request. So free set of activities be well known. The machine learning will learn this and we learn it over a long period of time. So it knows it's you and usually you don't do anything different uh, uh, from, from the ordinary. Now the froster, because he wants to, to, to go and, and basically change the shipping address, for example, or the wire, he's gonna do a couple of, of extra steps in this particular use case. 
first of all, maybe um, from the Equifax, he can't get your password. So he's going to try to run various password, and I, it's going to have several failed logins. And you can have a rule base saying, you know, after five, block it. But, you know, they are smart. They're going to do two, two every three months, and you're not going to see it. Well, the situation is, suppose they have two or three failed logins, and then a successful login, then the machine system start to go and track that and look at the deviation with your normal behavior. Here, for example, we kind of know they're going to disable security alerts because they don't want to be alerted. They want to enter a new phone, new email address, and, and you know, enter let's say a non dual amount of, to be wired, these are all deviation from the normal baseline. And the machine learning will catch it in real time, raise the risk score and, and output it um, in either a visual format that is for fraud, but it could output it for your uh, in API so that your other system is going to catch it so that they can act on it. So behavioral analytics fraud detection is truly about baseline user behavioral uh, no, no, uh, baseline the normal profile and detecting the, the deviation uh, from, from that baseline. Let me walk you through another visual here that shows the difference or how rule-based machine learning can complement rule-based, you know, conventional rule-based. Uh, what this figure shows on the top is usually in a rule-based system, uh, you will put static upper and lower bounds, like if more than three logins, you know, use this. Uh, so usually what you're going to detect is those, uh, the, the alert that you're going to see is anything that exceeds the upper bound and the lower bound, and these are fixed threshold, and that's why rules are for. They, you, you would have someone that goes in and say, okay, more than nine, do this, more than 100, do this. Um, well, it works fine until the froster operates within the band. And, uh, and, and, and in, in this particular context, time is not on your side because they, they, they play time, right? They're going to stay there for a long time and play within the band. Now, within the band, the rule doesn't detect absolutely nothing. Uh, uh, and, and at the end of the day, you may be compromised without knowing it uh, after, after six months. Well, rule base is important if you have finite, discrete rules. Uh, in, for example, uh, in regulatory filing for AML, uh, you know, if you have above 10,000 and you need to find a currency transaction report, rules are fine and they should be there because they are dictated by very discrete rules and, and definition. Well, when it comes to fraud, uh, hacking and, and, and fraud, uh, this is going to be difficult because if the fraudster goes within the band, uh, unless you do activity-based behavioral monitoring, you're going to catch it. And machine learning does uh, detect that. For example, transaction volume velocity will be tracked. Again, machine learning is over time and they analyze everything on the time base. Uh, transaction IP velocity, transaction risk scoring, all that is being tracked in a, in, in, you know, in a multi-criteria fashion. Data science people would say it's multivariate, but it's very important you can track more than you know, 24 of those attributes over time. And this is the models that we have been building at Guardian for a while now. And of course, you can add to it that the user behavior itself, the device access patterns, all that will make, make the, 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 the fraud model, detection model, more accurate. But this is what, in, in substance, what machine learning is give you as a capability. Um, now, what's the outcome? Uh, as a, a fraud management expert and practitioner at Guardian Analytics, uh, the outcome is truly about two things. Uh, how, how many fraud can you detect in a day and how many fraud resources you have. Um, now, financial institution that's been doing this for a while have uh, a fraud team, right? It's probably not or less the case for, for uh, online portals, e-commerce that, you know, will probably doesn't have that kind of organization. But nevertheless, the, the, the resource equation is absolutely the same. Uh, if an analyst can only cover, let's say, 20 alerts per day, well, uh, the first will know it. He will send fast alerts so that it exceeds your capacity level so that basically at some point the number of alerts will not be managed at all. And these are the risk exposure. Now, the reason why rule base has a linear growth, in other words, if you have a lot of alerts, you will need to recruit a lot of people uh, in a very linear way because 
they don't learn from the alerts. Um, you know, each alert is the same, and, and they and you don't know at that point it's a false positive. You just need to go investigate, open up. So maybe the logging has exceeded nine. There's an alert. Well, next day exceeded nine, another alert, and you have to investigate because you don't know if it's true or not. Well, the froster knows that, so they can do it in a way that you are stretched and your risk exposure start to be bigger. Um, well, by as for machine learning, the key point is the machine learns the alerts patterns. So as it's reoccur, it's going to say, well, it's not a false positive, it's a true alert, or it's a false positive, I'm not going to alert you. And that's the whole merit of machine learning. In other words, in terms of impact of resources, it's going to be start to flatten out uh, the number of alerts so that the outcome is with the same level of resources, you can cover way more alerts uh, as the number of alerts goes, goes up. Uh, that's the, the, the main benefit of AI and machine learning, and at Guardian Analytics, we have ensemble of models uh, that has been fully tested for the past eight years um, and, and deploy, um, uh, oh, by the way, sorry, uh, and deploy among, um, you know, 4, 450 banks. But more importantly, what happens if you don't have fraud resources? Uh, we have a frost desk management service that will protect you. And that would work for you know any financial institution that would like to to to, to start before you know building a full organization, or for online vendors, online portal vendors that basically doesn't have a, an organization yet to go about uh, fraud management. Uh, but more importantly, all those ensembles are being fully tested. Uh, over 450 financial institution has been using our, our our ensemble and our models to protect themselves. Uh, is about four. 40 million commercial and retail account holder, and about 5 billion in assets of banking activities. So that's conclude uh, our session, and uh, I will open up the Q&A session. So you can, we're gonna start answering the question uh, that you have entered in the question box. Uh, Susan, the, what do we have today? So we have we have questions for you, Andras. Um, you say don't rely on rules, but the reality is that banks have been using rules for years with some success. How can you capture all of that historically? Uh, hope all that historical knowledge with machine learning only. Well, you know, obviously this is a transitional uh, uh, progress. So there's, I, I say there's two things. One. Uh, augment uh, machine uh, rules with machine learning algorithms, right? So kind of not a, uh, you know, big bang kind of approach, but a slower and, uh, approach and running algorithms in parallel. And also, uh, second, secondly, let machine learning algorithms learn and burn in, if you will, give them time to be able to understand your environment's uh, peculiarity, peculiarities and, and really allow for these algorithms to uh, do a good job of, of really uh, picking up your customers' behaviors and, and always uh, try to get some, some um, explanations, right, as to why you know, the algorithm uh, scores something high or low. What are some of the reasons for doing so? Okay. Um, there's another question actually for you, Andres, again. Uh, you mentioned peer-to-peer -peer fraud. Uh, what, what does it mean? So so peer-to-peer -peer fraud can mean uh, basically uh, uh, payments, right? When you have... Uh, Accomplices, uh, so peer to peer payments, right, in this space, um, really uh, getting into understanding you know, how someone pays another person, you know, are there any collusion, collusive techniques, and then the here where you kind of have multiple fraudsters basically playing in a ring or an organized crime to solicit and elicit money from the bank, uh, or, multi or even more, you know, three or more. Uh, players being in a chain, you know, check, kiting, or, or even, like I said, newer style peer-to-peer -peer payments, right, I, I think are important to, to understand here. Okay, thank you, Andres. Uh, there's actually a question for Guardian, actually. I'm not a bank. Uh, we do have an online portal for our users. How could Guardian Analytics help in this instance? 
Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's actually uh, like it's the slide referring to online portals. Um, in terms of online portals compromise, uh, there, there's two, 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 four, two fraud type, right? One is um, um, uh, new, new account. So uh, one would go in and, and basically try to onboard. Um, this, this path has to do with controlling who is the originator and understanding if it's uh, the risk on that, on that merchant in the case of an online vendor um, is, is worth taking. Uh, it, it truly borders what we call AML and QYC, know your customer here, and uh, Guardian Analytics will release a product for that. Um, but uh, right now, what we do is we give you the ability to, um, at, at new customer onboarding time, to trigger via our API uh, other services like verification servers, so on and so forth. And uh, later on, we'll give you the ability to QYC that, that customer. As for onboarded customer, uh, this is where we really uh, lay out our uh, behavior analytics at the front, where, uh, first of all, we can analyze the device. So uh, again, what Andras actually were talking about, um, what we call biometrics fingerprinting, which means basically it's like uh, your device would, as you touch your device, as you, you navigate, you basically leave a fingerprint. And that cognitive fingerprint has been caught by, by the machine learning, and they know that if that device is supposed to be, should be you. Uh, um, and uh, we caught that at the front. And then if for whatever reason uh, the, the fraudster is able to go through, then we're going to, on the back, analyze all the transaction and send the deviation. Uh, and this is how we, we help uh, you protect yourself and detect and, and prevent um, in terms of uh, fraud detection. Um, I have another question. Can you provide an overview of how Guardian Analytics protect banks against micro deposits by threat actors as part of account takeover attempt? That's a very detailed question. Well, first of all, it, there's two types, right? I mean, at this point in time, you need to understand the type of account uh, that you have. Now, within our models, uh, the models has, I'm not going to use big words, but we have an entity model that allowed us to understand the bank account types. So micro deposit would be, would be classified. So we have classifiers for that. And, and usually, uh, again, the same technique, a, a normalcy behavior of a normal account holder for micro deposit will be learned and learn not only on that account, but across 450 banks. And that's coming from the power of what we do. In other words, that knowledge is, 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 is compounding as, as uh, you know, more banks are, 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 are transacting uh, using our, our, our fraud system as a detection mechanism. So in other words, we, we are like the, the antivirus for transactions. So we have libraries of models that we learn and that knowledge being learned and relearned. So the models continuously self-update itself. So in case of micro deposit, we will know exactly the patterns. And in account of the account takeover, well, first of all, at the front, we should, we should detect it. I mean, whatever it does, the, the, the session uh, hijacking, or whatever they're doing, and then changing the password because, or, or taking control over the account, these activities we will detect immediately. Uh, and the compounding the risk at the front and the risk at the back to make it so that we basically put in high priority alerts risk-wise, and API-wise, of course, we visualize it for you, so you, as a fraud team, you, you could go and, and do something about it, but you could also automate it via our API and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it, reject it, or challenge it. Okay, and no more question. Well, we have more questions, but fortunately, we are now out of time. Uh, We'll be sending you an email with the link to the recording this week. And uh, please feel free to ask questions via the web. We will answer them uh, as fast as possible. Thank you for joining us today.